Let me start now. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome back again to our 5G, uh, APEC 5G industry community. So this is uh, the host, Terence uh, from GSMA, heading the APEC 5G and IoT community. So welcome to join our another healthcare industry interest group. So this is a workshop about connected healthcare in the 5G era. Uh, welcome to pose your question in the Q&A box. Uh, our speaker will answer online or follow up offline. Uh, so this workshop also provides simultaneous translation on English and Mandarin. So you can select the uh, English or Chinese channel in the Zoom menu. So the healthcare sector have huge challenge uh, with the COVID-19 impact to the existing healthcare services resources. So this virtual event uh, will bring together mobile healthcare and technology specialists from regulator, healthcare and ICT ecosystem from APEC and Europe. They are going to share you about the latest development vision and discuss on some hot topic. Regarding to the agenda today, we have a very good live of speaker for the two hour content. So after my quick opening, you will hear about uh, the vision on developing smart hospital in the 5G city, delivered by uh, Hong Kong Hospital Authority. And then we have uh, a speaker from China. They already doing a lot on 5G hospital. So, uh, and China, China Soft International, uh, they are going to share about the best practice for smart uh, healthcare in the 5G era. And next, we have a pair of speakers from Germany, Europe. Uh, they are working very closely to deploy 5G healthcare in Europe and global. So it will be uh, delivered by uh, Detecton International and also uh, Fujitsu. Uh, and then next, we have a speaker from Philippines, uh, from HealthNow, uh, which is the leading telehealth application in Philippines. So they will share about the topic, how to get the health uh, you need in your way. And finally, we have a very good panel to discuss about how we can accelerate digital transformation uh, with policy, technology, and ecosystem and partnership. So this section will be moderated by uh, the founder of our IoT, uh, IoT Singapore Association and uh, join with HealthNow, uh, Huawei, and also FPT software. So let's start. Uh, in case you are the first time joining this uh, industry interest group uh, from GSMA, uh, just to let you know, GSMA represents the uh, mobile industry all over the world. We have uh, over 1,000 members across 200 market and country. Uh, we drive an uh, industry program that can add value to uh, digital economy by working with our members and uh, government. Uh, every year, GSMA also produce very large uh, industry leading event, uh, bringing more than 200,000 uh, 200, professional uh, together to uh, shake the industry, uh, leveraging the MWC at Barcelona, Shanghai, Las Vegas, and Africa. Uh, in the region APAC, we also host Mobile Fee 60 at Singapore on August this year. So 5G already rolled out for, uh, since 2019. And at the end of last year, quarter three, there are already one, 172 uh, mobile operator rolled out uh, in more than 68 market. Uh, in the region APAC, we also have more than 15 uh, operator uh, market rolled out. Uh, in ASEAN, we have Thailand, Philippines, Singapore, Indonesia, and recently joined by uh, Malaysia rolled out 5G. So APEC is a very huge big market, uh, also very fat man. Uh, so we see that uh, the reason to create a community in order to support government and enterprise to uh, accelerate digital transformation with the powerful technology like 5G and IoT. So we have a contributor member more than 15 in different country. Uh, so we are working closely to create a fee interest group in manufacturing, healthcare, logistic port and transportation. So today we are focused on healthcare sector. Uh, we already produced some very good case study with our contributor member uh, who are already pioneering on the 5G hospital. 
and also in manufacturing and logistic port and transportation. So welcome to go to our website to download this case study. So if you are already the member, of course, you already receive our monthly newsletter and able to access to our uh, uh, monthly uh, workshop, including today uh, and also the past. If you miss any, any one of this, you want to stream back, join our community, and then you can visit uh, this uh, access to these resources. So after this healthcare workshop, we will have a uh, physical event at, at Bangkok on 16 to 17 of June, uh, organized uh, by Thailand government and with uh, and supported by GSMA. Uh, there will be a uh, industry uh, topic about 5G as well. So if you are interested uh, to visit, let me know. Uh, we can give you some uh, passes. And then uh, followed by this, we have a very uh, good regional conference organized by GSMA at Singapore uh, on 2nd to 3rd of August. So this is a, uh, uh, this event will be focused on uh, building digital nation, uh, imit imitation uh, on the leadership uh, for government and the tech leader. So we have themes like connectivity, innovation, and digital policy, and of course, uh, there will be com uh, community activity. Uh, we will host the Digital Industry Summit uh, that will talk about connected manufacturing, uh, advanced mobility and transportation, and also very importantly, uh, digital healthcare. So if you are looking for speaking opportunity or, or interested to get a brand exposure, please connect me, uh, we can discuss. Uh, if you are not joined uh, the community, again, welcome to join. Uh, there are already a lot of resources available. And if you want us to facilitate to uh, do some uh, uh, proof of concept on 5G, uh, welcome to reach me. Uh, we can connect you to a different contributor member in the region. So now let's look at the healthcare sector. So COVID-19 impact is very obvious uh, with the uh, resources and the, and the healthcare system. It also changed the people behavior. So you see now more people uh, prefer less exposure in hospital and clinic, but more willing to accept uh, online diagnosis, uh, pharmacy on delivery and online payment. So there are also of course rising demand on healthcare services with uh, aging population, increasing uh, prevalence of uh, chronic diseases, increasing middle class in the region. And we do believe technology enable digital transformation uh, which has uh, anticipated to go significantly in the coming years uh, from uh, 147 billion in 2019 up to 235 uh, billion in 2023. So uh, 5G connectivity really become a key enabler for a lot of technology like IoT, edge cloud computing, AR, VR, or metaverse, robotic, uh, big data, machine learning, uh, analytics, and AI that could all apply to uh, make a better healthcare services. So 5G in healthcare market is uh, estimated about uh, annual compound growth rate about 76% uh, uh, from 2021 to uh, 2026. And the good news is uh, APAP, our region is the largest opportunity market. So connected healthcare really create a better outcome uh, for patients in different scenarios. You can imagine if a patient can be monitoring uh, with uh, connected devices at home, uh, at the nursing home, at ambulance, or even in the hospital stay. Uh, the benefits also covering the ecosystem pair in different scenario. You can expect if a connected hospital, there will be a lot of uh, efficiency uh, when using 5G connectivity to allow a different kind of uh, automation process. So 5G is not really only a technology developed for a uh, consumer scenario uh, in mobile phone use case. This is really powerful with different kind of feature that can fit for different verticals, including healthcare, of course. So the enhanced mobile broadband features with gigabit throughput, uh, much better coverage than 4G and more mobility than Wi-Fi. It will allow very high resolution medical image uh, and large volume file that could be transferred very quickly uh, for analysis and dialysis. Uh, telemedicine will, will become much better enhanced with high definition uh, virtual consultation. Uh, remote patient monitoring, uh, augmented, uh, augmented pharmacy with 5G enabled AI and robot work. 
uh, physician training, uh, you can expect uh, uh, it can be easier to support skill development. Uh, distraction, uh, we have uh, VIP with 5G uh, enable AI, uh, power AR. Uh, AR. Uh, and of course, there are low latency, uh, ultra low latency uh, communication, which means critical IoT support application, uh, which are uh, down to uh, latency on a single digit millisecond. So it means that uh, it will allow remote uh, expert for collaboration in surgery, which means uh, not everyone have to sit in a single uh, physical uh, operation room, uh, but still allow the uh, possibility for uh, uh, collaboration on the surgery work. And in the future, it will also possibly for remote surgery uh, in different uh, rural area. Uh, we also see mobile robot drones AGV uh, as 5G could enable very high density of robot for different functions such as surveillance, disinfection, delivery, and then connected ambulance uh, with 5G that could allow uh, earliest uh, diagnosis. Uh, finally, massive time uh, machine uh, communication, which means uh, million of uh, devices can be connected uh, in a very dense area up to uh, one square kilometer. It means that uh, the uh, massive wireless sensor network can be deployed to monitor uh, the environment for smart hospital uh, uh, for uh, allowing automation and different kinds of uh, operational excellence. So uh, I think the good news is there are already a lot of pioneer in the region start the journey of 5G. Today, we really get that we have a speaker from China. Uh, China actually already developed uh, uh, some 5G hospital network standard. Uh, in Hong Kong, uh, you will see uh, after me, uh, Dr. Zhang will talk about uh, their uh, vision and development on smart hospital uh, with 5G. Uh, of course, uh, you will also hear the Philippine uh, uh, Health Law, uh, how they building the telemedicine with uh, 5G and 4G technology. So now let me move to uh, the first speaker, uh, which is uh, Dr. Uh, Andy Zhang, uh, head of the Information and Technology and Health Informatic uh, from Hong Kong uh, Hospital Authority. Uh, over to you, Dr. Zhang. Okay, thanks, Terence. Um, I'll can, share my screen. Yes. Yeah, I'll, I'll share my screen. If I can find it. Here we go. All right. Can you see the screen there, Terence? Yes, very clearly. Okay, great, great. So thanks for the introduction, Terence. Um, so uh, as Terence said, I'm from the hospital authority in Hong Kong. Um, I'm not a 5G expert at all. I'm a doctor who has spent his entire career, uh, much of it in the hospital authority, trying to digitally enable healthcare in a very large healthcare organization. And so I'm going to share with you a bit about what we've done in the past, but really focus on what are our future directions. And there'll be a few slides on 5G in the middle there. So let me just introduce where we stand in terms of health IT. Uh, uh, in the hospital authority. So we are by far the largest healthcare provider in Hong Kong. Uh, we spend about half of the healthcare dollars in the whole city, but we serve, for instance, 90% of all inpatient care comes through our door. So we're, we're a very high volume, high intensity uh, organization. You can see there's 84,000 staff, 29,000 beds, 43 hospitals and a, over hundred clinics. Um, and much of the act, almost all of the major clinical activity is all happening on the electronic system, uh, which was built by our uh, uh, IT team in-house. Okay. So um, excuse the immodest uh, heading on this slide, but there's no question that we are uh, one of the largest uh, in-house uh, health IT shops in the in the whole world, let alone in, in Hong Kong. Uh, we have we host the, perhaps the largest IT infrastructure in Hong Kong, um, and it you know we a, a system like this is very large, very complicated. Very few places in the world have the ability to build something like this themselves. It's taken us you know thirty years. So, so oh this this has been a, a thirty year journey, and I've been here for almost in that entire time. Um, and it's like I said. It's, it's a system we've developed over multiple generations from 
uh, when hospital authorities set up, it was a greenfield, which meant everything was paper, everything was manual. And we've got, and we're up today where we're calling it CMS phase four. Uh, CMS is the clinical management system. That's our core electronic medical record system. And uh, almost everything's uh, digital now, but we're still doing a lot of work. And let me share a little bit of that with you. For instance, HA Go is, um, now we started writing apps a few years ago, but you know, it's, it, healthcare is you know, immensely complex. So there's uh, basically an infinite number of apps you could develop. And it quickly became apparent that just writing apps was not gonna cut it. It's just way too confusing. Uh, there's too much overlap in functionality. So then we integrate into one single app and it's called HA Go. And now HA Go is now becoming our digital front door for all of our digital service services within an HA. Now it's HA Go has been, been launched a few years, but it's, it's still really early days. We're, we're really ramping up the functionality that's available in HA Go for patients to manage their own care and interact with the hospital authority uh, digitally. And uh, you can download it yourself. Uh, it doesn't do very much if you're not in Hong Kong, but uh, you can have a look at it. Now, this is just to give you a quick taste. I'm not going to go through the slide, but we, we're continuing to operate, uh, I, you know, hopefully at, a, at, a, at, this, at a very high level, because as digital, health, digital becomes more and more critical to the operation of the whole healthcare uh, system in Hong Kong, we, we have to make sure that we're running at, this, at that level. And so this is, our, this is sort of like how we're presenting our um, coming five years. I um, mean, you see some of the areas we're covering there, the digital hospital, but we're going into, into the community, a lot of focus on the patient experience, and that's why I emphasize HA Go. Um, and also the whole operation side, the digital workplace for staff within HA, that's something we're, we're spending a, a lot of effort now. Um, innovation and data, just massive things, and we're doing a lot of work uh, there, and I'll mention that a bit as well. And bot on the bottom side, it's the whole I to how, does I, how do we keep the IT team up to level? How do we build the platforms that support the future of digital HA? And how do we build up the IT team itself in terms of, you know, we've spent a lot of effort transforming the whole team to what we hope to be a world-class IT uh, organization. Okay, I'm gonna have to use, there we go. All right, I'm just gonna very quickly, because uh, 5G, I believe 5G, I mean, we're, we're, all of our hospitals will become 5G over the next few years. Um, and I think 5G makes a lot of what we're doing today uh, better now. So what we're gonna we're, we're gonna become five G. Some stuff will get better just by just because of that. And over the over the coming years, there will be new use cases which are transformational, which are only possible with five G. To be honest, there's not a lot of those in operation now. But I think these things will pop up once we have a large enough coverage of five G. These things will pop up. Um, but uh, I'll just share with you a little bit about what we're, what we're doing right now with five G. So this is, this is an, uh, one of the first programs we've done. Now, this is actually still in development, but the idea here is that now patients, when they're in the ambulance, sometimes they go from a less acute hospital, they'd be transferred urgently to a more acute hospital. They're, you know, these patients are very sick. They need to be monitored uh, on the fly. And what we're trying to do here is put in the, the monitors in the ambulance to follow the patient as they go through and then have that data available live for the care team at both the sending hospital and the receiving hospital. Um, and the key bit that was missing before, of course, was the, the in-flight data. So that's what we're doing here is setting this up. You, and, and of course, you know, you can't just do this, you know, just openly. It's got to be over a, over a VPN to protect all that patient data. And so we're, we're setting this up and, you know, uh, we'll see how it goes. I think, I think it'll be helpful, but it's only an early stage pilot, as I said. Now, another thing that we're doing is uh, in the operating theater. So Drungano, so we, we have sort of two pilot hospitals here. That first hospital, that first example was coming from the, the, the Northern Territories West Cluster. This is from the Kowloon East Cluster, where Drungano has been setting up as, you know, our first 5G hospital. And one of the areas they're doing is operating theater. So having the operations being uh, uh, um, videoed and then shared live with uh, maybe a senior doctor, maybe as a wider sort of educational thing. And we're trying that using 5G for that, you know, for a higher resolution and to have multiple feeds, all that sort of stuff. So those are the sort of the two first areas that we're using 5G. But like I said, uh, I'm, not really, I'm, not, I'm not really a technologist, I'm a healthcare guy. So we're looking at overall, how does digital help make things better for healthcare? Now we've traditionally operated uh, on the bottom two circles, clinical excellence and operational efficiency, because that's where the core of how we, because like I said, uh, we're a low cost provider. Well, everything's basically free for patients, but uh, very cost efficient, uh, very high volume, right? So we had to focus on those while delivering clinical excellence. 
What, we, what we've also been focusing now is also looking at the patient experience more, right? So at that intersection is something we call the smart hospital. Using technology to try and satisfy that intersection of excellence, centric, patient centricity, and operational efficiency. Um, and we, those are the, a constellation of technologies that we're putting under the smart hospital moniker. So, so this is sort of a flagship umbrella, you could call it. And, and there's, there's lots of things we're doing under the smart hospital. And you can see here the categorization, five areas, smart care, smart hospital management, smart support services, smart facility, and uh, infrastructure and smarter staff, right? Now, those are just, again, labels, but you can see under each label, there's a multitude of things happening. And of course, these are just the highlights. There's way more than this happening. And you see we're, we've got our hands very full uh, over the coming years. Now, a lot of this has already been uh, developed. It's, this has been happening for a few years, but there's plenty more on the horizon. I'm gonna share with you a little bit a little bit of some of those some of those highlights. So one of the things we're doing, which I, I think you know, five G will definitely uh, help with, is robotics. So in fact, there's a, there's an awful lot of uh, use cases in in um, uh, healthcare for robotics, and you can see a list there. But I'll just uh, maybe show with you a little bit of our experience. So now th there are there are you know, dedicated surgical robots, and that's kind of a separate thing. Those are very specialized robots. They sit in the operation in the uh, OT, and they're basically provided by you know these these very advanced companies, uh, and we just buy the robot in, it's a standalone thing. But when I'm talking about the robots that we're looking at more, these are the sort of more like, they're more like general purpose robots, which we, we put into the clinical workflow and the clinical environment, right? So that's actually quite recent, 2019, uh, more or less the first uh, use uh, that, that we had more for delivery type stuff, but then we're looking at, uh, at delivery to the bedside, um, and then we sort of, uh, I'll show you the next slide, which is what we call the five-star rangers. Oh, sorry, this is, this is the one where we're, we're delivering uh, things to patients. Now this was especially during COVID, um, well, which is still ongoing of course, but when patients were in isolation, every time a, a, a healthcare staff has to contact that patient, they have to do the full gown, um, you know, all that stuff, and then they have to throw it away. So it's, it's very wasteful, very, very time consuming and, and labor intensive. So instead of that, could we just stick the things on a, on a, little, a little commercial robot like that and just send it into the room, patient picks it up and then the thing comes out again and you can just disinfect the machine, right? So that's the sort of thing that we've been using it for in the isolation uh, or the COVID hospitals. Now, this is uh, what we call the five-star rangers. One of the, one of the um, strategies that we decided uh, to take was to humanize these robots, make them less intimidating, more friendly, right? And so part of this is, you know, giving them names, give, you know, decorating them a little bit to make them sort of cute and all that. So people are uh, happier to see these, these little guys. So you can see here's a variety of different robots they put in to, to Teen Story Hospital um, and, you know, with, with, you know, their names. So uh, a, a little navigator robot that helps you get around, uh, a janitor robot to cleaning the floor, a security patrol robot, um, uh, a housekeeping robot and like that little delivery thing. And then uh, finally, uh, this, this is the larger scale transport thing, you know, with things like bedding and all that. So, so that's sort of the family that's been set up and there's, they're working there. And sort of what our idea is that we pilot things sort of in, a, in a, a decent scale at certain key hospitals and then they demonstrate that they learn about it and demonstrate how it works. And then we get the other hospitals to take it up once, they've been sh once it's been shown to them, this thing actually works in a Hong Kong environment. And we do that a lot. All right, so you're starting to see this spread out. So we've got one here in the, in the Pamela Yud Hospital, um, uh, more of the cleansing type robots. And in, um, in Sha Tin Hospital, they're using it as a fall prevention uh, ambassador. So I think it's providing more information to the elderly who visit there. So you can see there are a variety of use cases and this sort of expanding within HA. Now I want to now jump into uh, some of the more clinical aspects of uh, smart hospital. So we have, you know, one of the major areas called smart ward, and that really mostly we're talking about here ward, smart care, is probably, which is smart ward and smart clinic. And you can see again a whole bunch of stuff here that's being developed. And again, this is just highlights. Um, one of the things that that's really taken off is is um, uh, what we call the e vitals. So uh, I, I don't know if you've uh, any of you have been to a hospital. You know, often there's that piece of paper with a blood pressure and all those vital signs that somebody's drawing on a little piece of graph paper. Now we've converted uh, a, a large number of our awards already to doing it electronically. Um, and now it's like, this becomes an electronic piece of data which replaces the paper, it's true, but more importantly, it actually, that data now becomes available 
for more advanced things like early warning signals and analytics and all that sort of stuff. So we're really, really ramping that up. And once you have a critical mass of data, then you start being able to drive transformational change within the normal day-to-day -day ward care. But there's also other stuff here. Some of this is more, it really helps the, the doctor's workflow, helps patient safety, helps clinical quality. And you, this is just, again, we're ramping up this work and you see it's all sort of mobile and uh, much more user-friendly than it used to be. All right, now AI is, is a big area that we've, uh, uh, we, again, it's, it's early days. We, we, we've only been in this space for a short time, but tremendous potential, really tremendous potential. And so here, uh, this is just, again, a sample of some of the stuff that we've done already uh, or is in late stage development. And uh, these are just some examples. Now, uh, I do have here, a, I'm not gonna go through this because what, what, one of the key things about AI is of course that it's, it's so new that people don't really, they don't understand it. They're a little bit you know, hesitant about offloading uh, you know, decisions to, a, to an algorithm that they don't really understand. And you can't really, it's, it's, you, know, you, you can't really explain this stuff to, to a level that a, that a doctor is totally comfortable with if they use the traditional thinking, right? So we have to go on results. Um, and demonstrate the, the demonstrate the safety of these things. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're already we're gradually accumulating the information about how these things are helping uh, clinicians and how they're not exposing our patients to any risk, but giving them benefits. And uh, I, I, you know, I really don't have time to, to delve into it, but I'm just saying that as these use cases expand, what we're gonna see is a situation where we have a lot of these AI, and let's call them uh, software robots, which are running in the background, constantly just looking at what's happening to our patients and raising alerts when they see something that, hey, 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 look, this, this guy maybe needs this, or maybe this is not the right drug to use and that sort of thing, and popping those things up to, to the right doctor at the right time so that they can make a different clinical decision or at least be aware of something that may change their clinical uh, approach. Now, it, the, the AI is not making decisions for the doctor. We're not going that way yet. We're certainly just trying to be, it's more of an advisory service. It's helping protect both the, the patient and the clinician from possible problems. You know, that, that's sort of the approach we're doing. And you know, there's already been examples where we, it's pretty clear that we think this AI prevented something which could have been a, you know, a life-threatening uh, uh, situation. Uh, you know, it's a very complicated environment and people overlook stuff which the AI can pick up just because the AIs are always running Never get, never get tired. So a lot of potential here is there's so many things in a, in a complicated hospital environment that uh, you know in the old model need humans. There's really no other way to do it. You need highly trained humans to be always alert for all this stuff. AIs can take a lot of that uh, for the humans. And, and you see at the bottom, there's a thing called command center, which is trying to bring all of this together into like, you know, like a command center, which you, you've seen in NASA, but we've already built this out uh, within IT itself. And also uh, the first one we've built out is in Queen Elizabeth Hospital is already running. So, so that's the, the next area, command centers. And so, so what, we, what we're doing, um, we've got now with the first one has been, has been running in Queen Elizabeth and we already found that, okay, it can help with a lot of things. There's bed capacity. So bed management in, in again, in a high, intensity environment like HA, the beds have to be turned over and, and all this sort of stuff very, very quickly. Um, in terms of resources, I'm talking about things like portering and uh, all this sort of stuff, delivery and stuff. Um, now, the, the third one is the actual clinical situation, is to be able to bring, up, bring together uh, at, at a glance the whole situation within a ward, for instance, so that a doctor can, instead of having to physically go up to the ward always and check on things, they just pull it up on their iPad and they can see from wherever they are uh, where they can prioritize their time. Now, some other stuff we've done, for instance, here's a real-time tracking of, of stretchers, which means that, you know, as the patients are being pushed around in that, in that very busy uh, uh, accident emergency uh, situation, that we can electronically find out where things are. Used to be, you'd have to have a, 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 a guy, you know, run around and look for people because, you know, didn't know where they actually were. Now we can track them digitally. And also we're now going into sort of the more the, 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 the uh, execution side. Can we build in digital workflows that take this, uh, all this information and allow people in the command center to execute certain uh, operations uh, digitally? So, so that, that's sort of an early days, yeah. All right, now we did, we did indeed uh, extend this out in terms of in time of COVID. Now again, this is, this is, this is really uh, early stuff. And you can see here, there's a COVID ward view. Um, 
and uh, you know we've added lots of COVID information in and now so that's something where you know COVID is not over yet as you all know there's a fear there could be a sixth wave so really building this out to be to have more COVID specific information the other thing we're going to have to do now is to get this command center rolled out more widely in Hong Kong from that first hospital to to all of the uh, hospitals in Hong Kong and that's something we're focusing on right now. All right, the last topic I'm going to cover is, is telehealth. So I mentioned HAGO, which is a single patient app that we're putting everything into, right, for, for digital services within the HA. So what we've done is, I mean, you know, telehealth at its very core, you could just do it using a, a, a FaceTime or something, right? You have the video and all that. But, you know, it, it works in terms of just the video, but it, there's no integration with anything else. And the patients have to be reasonably savvy to, to use it, right? So what we did was we built that whole platform into the system. And when I say into the system, it's in HA Go, which means if you have HA Go, which you know, HA patients really should download, uh, the client is built in and it's built into our clinical systems in the hospitals and the clinics as well. So they can operate the, uh, the HA Go enabled telehealth just as part of an extension of their normal clinical workflow within the system. And that links up across so the patient then just as a one-click entry into their session, it's connected up, you know, it's all, all the appointments and all that stuff, the clinical information is all integrated together through these two platforms uh, and the video as well. So um, we also, uh, uh, the video is not the, the whole thing. For tele, it doesn't have to be video. I mean, you know, you refer to just phone call is one way to do it as, as well. But we, but through the apps, we're also trying to deliver uh, much more informational resources. So there's this concept about, about teleprescription, which means that we're prescribing apps and information to patients. Uh, it's not just prescriptions can be more than just drugs, right? So, you know, there's certain informational resources, there's exercises, there's all sorts of stuff which you can you can send to the patient digitally, and then they can take it forward from their own cell phone at home. And that's the idea. Again, the prescription side is integrated into the clinical app, into, uh, into CMS, and the patient receives that stuff through the HA Go. Again, the same platforms are integrated up, deliver the digital service from the clinician to the patient. Um, and and the, the other, uh, what I haven't shown here is that information from the patient can then come back as well. And that's sort of, that's sort of where we're working on now is to get more patient uh, information you know, when they're at home, measuring their own blood pressure, whatever, that sort of stuff, or you know, doing their exercises. And then those results can feed back into the system. So it becomes part of the, the medical record that the doctors can refer to during the next, whether it's a tele session or a live session, they can see all that information at a glance as part of the record. So the, so the idea really is that, that the smart hospital concept, because as we said, the, the patient experience is a key part of that. Really, the HA Go is key to delivering that to our patients. So if you turn up at a clinic, now, this is something that's been enabled, that we're, you know, we're still working on the rollout of how you can have basically a paperless outpatient appointment visit where you turn up and you never have to line up for this and that, you just do it all on the app. Um, and now you can, you, uh, most of the pieces are there. It's really sometimes just ex getting it all working at any specific location. Um, and that's something we're still uh, doing more on. But the idea really is that, you know, these two platforms, the CMS and the HA Go combined with, a, with an integrated flow, give all these benefits to the patients and, and to their carers. We have an explicit mode of caring for other people within HA Go, uh, looking after your parents or looking after your kids, for instance. And then from a clinical perspective, it's all on the same platform, so they know what's going on. And really, we think that having it built in, having it integrated, really allows our clinicians to go ahead and now change the way they deliver service. And that's where we're really focusing on in what we're talking about, the digitalization of HA. The digital HA is about transforming the service models to give you know, better service, but more efficiently with a better experience for both patients and for providers. And now, as a side benefit, of course, you have uh, less infection because you know it was no paper flying around, or even maybe you don't have the physical contact even. Um, and hopefully patients uh, are better informed and they get, you know, there's better communication between the clinical team and the patients. So, so that's just sort of like uh, uh, all I have prepared today, um, uh, just to give you, you know, a good sense of what we're doing in terms of the, the digitalization of healthcare in uh, the hospital authority. So uh, thank you.
Thank you, uh, Doctor Jack. Wow, I think I think uh, we learn a lot from uh, a uh, authority perspective. To uh, I mean, a very holistic picture to see how uh, Hong Kong Hospital Authority to transform uh, the whole sector. I mean, it's uh, not only on a patient angle, but also uh, to the end to end to the operation and how to integrate. I think is a very uh, in a lot of insight. Uh, there are a lot of questions to you on the Q&A boxes. Uh, I really appreciate for, for your presentation, very pyramidic, uh, very humble. I think your journey to 5G, like what you said, just beginning. We are looking forward for more maturity uh, of different use case and more, integrate, more integrate, uh, integrated uh, scenario to happen. So thanks again for Dr. Chen. Uh, please stay for a while to uh, help to answer some questions. Yeah, so I'll I'll type the answers into the chat. So thanks a lot yes. for the questions, and I'll I'll go mute now, and uh, you can move on. Yes. All right. Yes. Thank exactly. you. Okay. So uh, now uh, we uh, we are also an honor to invite uh, a speaker from China, uh, who is uh, David Liu uh, Liu Zhong. Uh, he will talk about uh, uh, best practice for smart healthcare uh, in the five G era. So. Uh, Mr. Uh, Liu is also the G, uh, general manager uh, of a smart campus department uh, in China Soft International. Uh, so Mr. Liu will uh, talk in uh, Mandarin. So if you want to listen to English, uh, please uh, select the English channel uh, in the Zoom menu. You can find it. Okay, over to you, uh, Liu Zhong. 刘总你可以打开你的镜头大家好 是一家在香港上市的企业哈，目前在全球有八万名员工。嗯，我们主要致力于就是这一波浪潮的数字化转型，嗯，服务于全球的客户的数字化转型。啊，这其中呢也包括这个智慧医疗啊，以及对于新的
以及设备的维修啊等，做了一个成本的进一步的控制。同时，对于一些紧急事件，我们也做到了高效的这个反馈和处理。嗯，这是在大陆，就是智慧医院建设的一些相关的背景哈。就首先第一个大的背景就是今年，啊啊，去年啊，甚至从一九年开始，呃，全球的这个疫情肆虐，啊，对全球的医疗系统呢产生了一定的冲击。那基于这个大的背景，我们结合于五 G 新的 ICD 技术，啊，实现了整个在疫情期间。对于智慧应用的高效应用，啊，包括远程医疗，同时我们也介入科技的手段，进一步提升了在新冠疫情下的医疗效率的提升，啊，那同时我们也整合了一些远程的医疗数据，来协助于整个医院的数字化效率的提升。这是我们在智慧医疗啊，面向于医院这个领域，我们提供的一些建设的能力啊。第一个就是我们有跨机构的互联互通的能力，针对于个人啊、电子病历等等，在保护个人隐私的情况下，实现了各个机构之间的互联和互通啊。第二个就是我们在运维上，通过新的 ICT 技术，包括五 G。实现了他们的高效自动化的运营，例如院区的物资管理等等。那同时，在整个医院的流程管理上，我们实现了借助于五 G 技术的整个医院的全流程管理，啊，助力整个医院实现以患者为中心、便捷高效的服务理念。那我们通过大数据的。技术啊，实现了整个基于临床、预防干干预等等一系列的大数据的辅助诊疗或者辅助诊断啊。通过一二三四几个方面，我们建立了协助于医院的持续化运营机制啊，帮助医院实现高效的运营。啊，这是我们在整个智慧医疗借助于五 G 的技术实现的，在医疗或者医院这个领域的一些成效。那从患者的层面来说，我们大大提升了患者的就医体验。对于医务人员来说，我们也实现了医务人员借助于新的 ICD 技术、五 G 技术的高效诊疗。啊，针对管理者。我们也提供了全场景的数字化，协助于管理者做一些辅助管理的决策。啊，这是我们借助于五 G 技术的一些典型的应用场景。嗯，举个例子，像我们借助于借助于五 G 的急救的智慧服务啊。借助于五 G 的远程医疗会诊，啊，借助于五 G 技术的远程设备的管理等等，啊，帮助医院在新的 ICT 技术背景下，实现整个医院的总体态势可控、医疗服务可管，保证整个医疗服务的创新程度，同时也助力医院实现围绕着患者、医务人员、管理者。全场景、全流程的可视化精细管理，啊，啊，这是刚才咱们说到的，就是借助于五 G 或者叫 ICD 技术，实现整个医院协助于管理者的一个可视化管理平台，使得医院能够在一张大屏上，整个展示整个医院的服务情况、业务情况以及运营情况。同时，对于一些突发事件，能够做出快速的响应。啊，这是我们借助于五 G 的智能导航，实现了
整个院内的导航，使得患者能够快速找到自己所需要去的或者触达的位置。啊，这是五 G 的另外一个应用，就是五 G 智慧服务的院前急救。啊，我们通过五 G 技术实现了医院和救护车之间的高效互动，借助于国内先进的北斗导航定位技术，实现了上车即入院。啊，这是针对于五 G 加 AI。我们实现了针对于远程医疗的远程诊断啊，辅助于医生做高效的这种诊断辅助啊，这个也是在智慧医疗领域我们实现的五 G 加移动医护啊，实现了对于远程、对于慢性病人的远程管理啊，同时也协助于医院。借助于新的五 G 技术，实现了移动查房和床边护理的远程管理和可控。啊，这是智慧病房，我们借助于五 G 和互联网技术，实现了整个病房的智慧化管理，使得患者有一个更好的就医体验，使得访客有一个更加好的感受，同时对于医护人员。以及安保人员提供了针对于病房的相应的管理手段和管理方式。啊，这是在智慧病房里边，我们对于五 G 加生命体征的一个监测。啊，就是通过五 G 的技术，我们能够监测到患者的心率、心跳等等一系列的高效的一些响应。啊，使得一些突发事件能够得到高速的、高效的响应。啊，这是在环境空间，我们借助五 G 的技术，啊，实现了针对于整个医院的空间的环境监测。啊，对于医院的温湿光照，啊，做了相应的环境监测和监控。使得医院这样的大密度的人群存在的这个空间，有一个更加好的环境和空间的体验。啊，这是针对于整个设备的可视化管理。啊，我们借助于五 G 技术，实现了针对于药柜、啊抢救车等等一系列物联网设备的高效运营和服务质量的高效管理。啊，例如对于新生儿的探视，啊，例如对于护士站的管理，啊，这是刚才，嗯、呃，上一个嘉宾也提到了，就是针对于五 G 加远程会诊，我们通过五 G 技术实现了对于特定区域的专科医院的远程医疗会诊，啊。助力于部分区域实现医护之间的资源平衡。啊，这是五 G 加影像云啊，我们通过五 G 的技术加影像，打造了共享智能便捷的影像云平台，实现了互联和互通，让影像连接借助于五 G 和新的 SD 技术无边界啊，就是我们实现了移动阅片等等一系列的。特性的功能、啊、这也是刚才针对于五 G， 呃，提到了远程的手术视教啊，使得先进的医疗资源能够实现跨时空的观摩，让学生以及其他的医院能够远程看到一些好的手术视教。啊，这是针对于五 G 加资产管理，我们通过五 G 的技术实现了整个院里的资产的全生命周期管理。啊，例如一些比较大型的 I R C U 设备，嗯、啊，以及一些其他的设备，我们实现了高效的盘点资产的可视
，以及借助于五 G 技术的资产的定位，高效的盘活了医院里边的一些啊闲置资产。啊，这是能耗管理，就是呃，全球提出了双碳战略之后，对于医院这种高耗能的企业，我们在碳达峰和碳中和上。也提出了针对于医院的水电、汽油的一系列的能耗管理，做到了能耗的实时监控、啊监测、异常的推送，帮助整个医院降能减耗。啊，这是五 G 加安防管理啊，针对于人、车、物，我们通过五 G 的技术实现了整个医院的安防管理。一体化，啊，提升了整个医院的安全水平。嗯，这也是哈、啊，针对物 G 的物联监控，啊，我们通过监控相应的物联设备的数据，实现了从运营数据到运营状态到固定状态的可视、可观和可控。啊，这是五 G 的设备运营，就是我们借助于五 G 等新的技术手段。从巡检计划开始，到整个的巡检结束，实现了端到端的闭环，绑住整个医院对于设备运维效率的提升，同时结合一些闭幕和祭祀的手段，保证医院的业务正常运行。嗯，这是对于新冠疫情情况下的借助于五 G 技术手段的高效处置，降低感染的风险。啊,啊，这是我们在基于医院这个场景，啊的一些亮点。第一个亮点就是五 G 加智慧医疗场景为医院创造更多的价值。举个例子，例如医院的医院前急救，啊，另外就针对于呃护理，我们也实现了针对于这个患者的智能护理。嗯，这是借助于闭幕手段，我们实现了整个院区的物联监控、设备运维、安防管控、能源管理的一体化管理。以上是我们在医院这个场景下，啊，借助于五 G 或者新的 ICT 技术提供的一些核心的能力。啊，下面有两个案例，我给大家重点讲一下我们在这个领域借助于新的 ICT 技术所提供的服务于医院的两个典型的案例。啊，第一个案例就是广东省第二人民医院，呃，第第二人民医院，啊，这个也是就是我们借助于新的 ICT 技术，以五 G 为核心，植入于整个医院，实现了在新冠疫情的情况下。创造了整个医院的无一例死亡、无一例院内感染、无一例转危转重的这种情况，三五的成绩得到了医院的高度认可。啊，这个是我们服务的甘肃省妇幼儿童医疗综合体，我们借助于五 G 技术，实现了整个医院的资产生命周期管理。能效智能优化的管理，设备可视的优化、运维管理，以及智能安防的可控管理，帮助医院提升整个医院的资产利用率，降低医院的能耗，降低医院的运维成本，同时降低医保、医院的安保成本。这是我们服务的另外一个案例，上海市同济医院。啊，我们借助于五 G、闭幕祭祀等先进化的手段。实现了这个医院的安消一体化的可管、可视和可控，使得整个医院的警情响应时间从分钟到秒。另外，从整个入侵检测上，误报率我们也做到了大大的提升。啊，从原来的误报率很高，到现在的误报率很低。啊，同时我们也借助于五 G 技术，实现了。楼宇的一体化的一键联动，嗯，以上是呃，中软国际基于五 G 等新的 ICD 技术，在智慧医疗领域的一些典型的场景应用，以及我们做的一些典型的案例，啊，谢谢大家。
啊，谢谢刘总 ，Thanks 啊 ，David 啊，诶，刘总有些问题在这个 Q&A box 啊、呃，请你去看看。So uh, let's uh, switch back to uh, our English channel. If you want to go back, you can go back to the default uh, in the interpretation button. Just want to remind, uh, please uh, post your question in the Q&A tab in the Zoom. Uh, it is much easier for our speaker to uh, respond because when you type in the chat box, uh, people will uh, lose it, right? So just uh, remind about this. So uh, yeah, we, we have to catch up the schedule. Uh, so uh, let me uh, introduce the next speaker, uh, which is coming from Germany. Uh, Kristen uh, Massam, uh, the partner from uh, Datacon International and also uh, Manfred, uh, Manfred uh, from the uh, Fujitsu. Uh, he's the business uh, development manager uh, on the enterprise 5G in Central Europe. Uh, over to you, Chris and uh, Manfred. So you have a slide to share, right? Uh, let me let me let me help. Ah, you, you do it yourself. Okay. Over to you, Chris. Ah, uh, you mute. We can't hear you. We can't hear you. Okay. Is it getting better? Yes. Perfect. So you can all see the slides. Yes. Great. Yeah. So thank you, thank you very much for the kind introduction, Terence. Uh, so that Manfred and I, I can give you maybe another perspective uh, on the connected health, on the 5G health topic, rather coming from the technology side, because what we heard so far was a lot about the use cases, all about the different challenges uh, which needs to be tackled. And it seems to be and that's also what we are facing uh, when talking about it, quite a complex situation uh, altogether. So Manfred, I think you just have to turn the screen or it just uh, looks turned from my point of view. <laughs> okay, may, may I have a problem just now? I would like to solve a problem. One moment. Perfect. Meanwhile, maybe just, that's perfect. Uh, just a short overview. Uh, we didn't want to go into that much detail about all the different use cases because we are not the experts in health. We are not medical doctors or anything like that. But we are rather uh, coming from the technology side, technology experts. And as you might have seen for the science fireside chat, uh, we are coming as a team because uh, tackling basically all of that coming now more and more from the technology side uh, around the hospitals and the use cases then extending uh, also uh, to the preclinical care and post uh, medical care after the treatment. Um, it's a very complex ecosystem. You can't tackle on your own. You can't tackle with only one technology. Also 5G alone wouldn't cut it as we also heard before. You have to involve many different aspects in it. And um, like that, um, we have to basically also consider other competencies, other partners involved. So we heard about the use cases. That's where we usually start, having something like that in front of us, starting to focus, for example, um, also about the customer journey, so to say. In that case, it would be the patient's journey. When he comes, for example, for the hospital, and whatever way that might be, might be by ambulance, might be by a regular appointment or something like that. So how is he treated? How is his data processed over all the experience until uh, he is healed and exits the hospital, for example, again? Just to give that short overview directly. And we also have um, yeah, quite some examples um, from different uh, implementations we did right now. Uh, also in different fields of health, but and not to go too much forward. Manfred, what are the experiences you had so far, also from the Fujitsu side, as an integrator, as a technology provider? So I hope um, the problems I've had with the connectivity is now solved. And uh, I try to give a short one overview. To be honest, uh, if I have seen what is possible in Hong Kong, it's possibly China, it 
it's tremendous. Unfortunately, so in the different countries, we have different laws and especially in Central Europe and also in some other countries in Asia, there are much more restricted laws and we have to be focused on what's possible uh, in, in the healthcare area with the data. So um, when I saw all these use cases, um, we have seen in Hong Kong, great, really, really great and such ideas. We have had also in, in uh, at Fujitsu and we realized this, we realized this in the different countries, but overall, unfortunately, this this whole thing is not possible especially in central europe so in central europe we have so strict laws that um, mostly the privacy of the patient is um, really uh, the main topic but um, with, with this privacy uh, we would like to to do also some additional thing and as we have seen in in, in the picture before there are these four uh, main things we have to focus. This is a patient, the patient, and uh, what the patient has from this advantage of five G of of IT of of all this technique we have. Um, and this is really a thing we have had um, in, in the area of, of COVID. Problem with uh, uh, workforce. So we had a this here locally uh, in Europe um, uh, in the workforce at, at the hospital and. With the right one support from um, data, we, we can support um, these, these guys with, to do the job easier, faster, simpler. And then it is on the other side, always the money you have to be in focused. And Germany is now the country with the third most uh, expense um, of cost per person. Um, uh, we are not able to raise the, the amount of money we, we can have from each person. So we have reduced the cost. We have to be focused on, uh, really on the, on, the, on, the, on the costs. And then at the end, there is, 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 is the state uh, population all over what we can do for the people. But well, overall, um, there's a big one um, challenge and 5G give us a chance to solve in different countries with a different speed this challenge. Back to Chris. I think it, that's a good distinction. Um, since we are also operating and working together in different countries, uh, mostly Europe uh, and the US, um, it starts with data privacy. That's why we unfortunately don't see any that spectacular uh, implementations as we have now witnessed uh, the example of Hong Kong. Uh, so far, um, it's rather a slower start uh, when we see it. So the first uh, hospitals, like the one in Bonn, um, where we implemented uh, 5G, started very simply with, oh, let's try, let's see uh, what it can do, because we also see some of the potentials we heard about from the colleagues before, um, basically starting with a connected infrastructure and figuring out what kind of assets uh, directly to connect. So in the uh, University Hospital of Bonn specialized on uh, very hard cases as well, having a lot of uh, diagnostic equipment, um, especially with handling image data when we have MRTs uh, and so on. And um, they needed, as we also learned before, provide that kind of data, most likely already in an aggregated way uh, to the doctor who is treating the patients as fast as possible and as mobile as possible. So then he is going on his route uh, to see the patients, um, having then uh, already a mobile device with him. And basically directly after the scan, he would have already the image data by now, um, which was processed uh, also over the different facilities, also over the different buildings, uh, so then he can access it. So that was one of the first data points we saw there. Um, and also the greatest need with a huge bandwidth and reliability needed. And yeah, of course, conserving data privacy, um, also the security uh, aspect of it, especially if I have a more mobile uh, diagnostic machinery, uh, transmitting that data, uh, there were some considerations might it have been done 
the fan networks as well. Um, but um, still, I uh, testing uh, what is the best to uh, first of all ruling out uh, to send it a, a private uh, Wi-Fi network and first going with a mobile network dedicated and especially protected against um, certain kinds of attack vectors uh, we are seeing and also um, going steps further from there because having that kind of data they can provide so it might be the image data from diagnostic um, as we learned, we are talking also quite a lot uh, by now about uh, the vital data you can get from the patients um, based on variables. Since this is a very valid data source year by year increasing in bigger percentages, actually, and we're talking about uh, maybe 17% of the patients in the last year um, providing, uh, sorry, the year uh, 2020 providing um, vital data via variables, uh, which you could already use uh, for further diagnosis um, that's now going over the 20%. And um, as we think and see, it will increase even further, being provided this IoT real-time data streams and making it way easier for the day-to-day -day operations we are seeing. And also um, um, basically driving the operation of a hospital and the overall process in, in higher efficiencies which is required, um, at least in most European countries, they want to reduce costs by still providing better uh, patient uh, satisfaction, also better patient treatment. And that seems to be uh, like something very hard to achieve otherwise. So we always try also to create cross-domain uh, knowledge and provide that because uh, Manfred and I, for example, also work a lot in manufacturing, a lot in logistics and having a look how we can transfer that knowledge from there. Um, how can we uh, bring that in without having to reinvent the wheel, so to say, to apply to the hospital side as well. So that would also provide new ways of thinking about information. I will give you um, some ideas in a second and providing actually also the use cases we heard about before, which weren't possible before. Um, because you might have even not thought about them possible. And then the heart of it is always the right kind of information. And that's the one you provide to the right person at the right time. So it might be the doctor, it might be even the patient himself or some other uh, third party needing the data points in a safe way. And for that, you have to go a whole information journey from where the data comes from to where the data is transmitted to where the data is stored processed and later on used for automation or for better decision-making in the end. And that might contain quite a lot of technology being combined in the end. But um, maybe just a small schematic we work with um, because that's actually quite versatile. Um, so wherever we look at uh, whatever domain, uh, it's especially true of also in health, um, you start the same way for this kind of digitization or connected journey. You always start with visibility. And that's when we usually talk about the digital twin, the main effort also uh, as next right now, when we see it in the hospitals, like in Germany, in Bonn, in Aachen, in Cologne, for example, uh, but also in some in the US, like Stanford uh, clinics, um, that they want to provide this digital twin, not only of the patient, but all the privacy concerns, of course, um, having been contained and secured, uh, but also over the overall processes, over the overall equipment. So with all what we heard about, like condition monitoring and so on, just knowing what's going on and there are the things at what point in time. Just to go over to create kind of transparency. So when we learn what to do with the data, actually, um, and provide some expertise already out of all these data streams, not uh, to get rid of some of the experts or the doctors or whatever, just uh, to support them, the data streams uh, behind it, because we might need more and more expertise, more and more knowledge, um, which we don't have by pure qualification and education available at our fingertips at the moment. And of course, go that far as to help also the simulations and so on, to have an idea about the patient's health, but also about everything we need to contain, for example, in a hospital, uh, to keep everything running 
in the best possible condition. And best of all would be a self-learning mechanism, which is adaptive, still going on by the increasing amount of data flowing in and being able to handle it uh, for better and better treatment later on. So this is just a host of technologies. Manfred, you also know uh, very well, um, coming from industry, but true, as I said, and also all the other domains, we actually have to tackle and connectivity, as you see on the top left corner, is just one of those. So what are the other technologies we are recently working on in the different cases? For instance, let's give you a few from, from some project I have done in, in, in the past. And it looks like it's so easy to connect all this stuff in, in, in a big one clinic. But uh, here in Europe, we have a lot of old one buildings, with a lot of concrete, with a lot of steel in the buildings. And this is really a challenge for, for the different um, connectivity solutions. And my experience is uh, indeed that uh, mobile communication, we started here locally first with 4G solutions, and then we move just now to the 5G. And with 5G, we are able to connect much more better um, in, in, in the different buildings and also outside of the buildings. There are some use cases, uh, for instance, wheelchairs. It's Unbelievable, but um, approximately 10% of wheelchairs each year um, are go away at, at the clinic. They do not know where they are, and the wheelchairs are lost. They lost a lot of um, investment. So when we start with such simple things that we would like to have an overview of the wheelchair, and indeed, and to be honest, at the moment we didn't start wheelchair purely by 5G. We start with Wi-Fi solutions and then connect it to a um, concentrator and uh, this concentrator was connected by 5G. Because unfortunately at the moment, uh, the, the endpoints of 5G are a little bit expensive. And if you make a right one calculation, you see that you have to, to use a mixture of technology you, you should um, use some um, short range technology, water technology, and in addition to 5G. But overall, I hope in a mid and long term, we will solve this connectivity issue. More, it's more a price issue also from, the, from, from the technology. All is there, but just now it's a little bit um, high priced. So I expect uh, the prices go down to the next two to five years. So we can use at every item on 5G endpoint and can have an overview to, to each um, device like wheelchairs, like beds, like other stuff. But at the moment, uh, the calculation says, be careful, use the right technology. And that's, that's the tricky part of it. Uh, also, where um, we uh, found together, uh, for example, uh, our institutions. Uh, on the one hand, uh, it's Datacom, where uh, I'm responsible for hyperconnectivity uh, in the topic of it, um, with the advisory role in the Deutsche Telekom group, because you need to have an overview of all the technology. Uh, of all the possibilities of all the challenges, also the interdependencies while setting it up. And especially when you have still to integrate it, not only build it in a greenfield, completely new hospital, but if you have to implement it in a running operation and keep it running, of course, when needing the experts for integration, needing the experts, the solutions, the services for all the different parts I placed here. And that's what we are aiming for and working on also together. Uh, to bring it into a kind of a construction kit. Might you know uh, from the childhood with uh, bricks and stones and so on, you can combine that easily, which are comparable, which are interoperable. And that's what we are working on, on a level between the companies, but also in the higher institutions, like where we have, um, um, for example, the interest groups from the IT industry, Bitcom, where, I'm, for example, a board member for industry 4.0, not only manufacturing, logistics, and all others, uh, thinking about what might be the standards, where to combine it, and where to process the data, basically, from the source 
uh, to where the place the decision is made or where it's automated in the end and providing it as easily as possible so that you can build all these use cases quite fast and not always take a big engineering project uh, out of it to do so and yeah basically using all the expertise already available uh, between those so that's the idea behind it and we just brought you one of the examples i hope it's okay um, if that one is in the manufacturing setup because we didn't have a clearance yet uh, for a trial we are doing in a hospital uh, to show those pictures yet um, but it's basically um, what I was talking about, this cross-domain application. Here we have a robot, which, um, as we also heard before, you will need more and more just for simple service tasks, maybe providing a beverage to a patient who is thirsty or something like that, maybe also um, with some secure locks, uh, bringing the medicaments uh, to the different stations directly and automatically from the pharmacy so that, that there is no risk of um, medicine misuse or theft or something like that. And as you have seen, um, while this uh, AGV is running around, he is automatically blurring directly on the sensor side, uh, also the picture, because he's recognizing the person. So that's also never uh, stored anywhere. You just have that blurry picture, for example. Um, but the interesting part is you can use those automated, of course, in a 5G network um, because it scales better, could be done in Wi-Fi in smaller scale, uh, potentially, um, to drive things from A to B. Might be also the dirty gloves or other uh, infectious uh, material and the waste that we have in that regard. Uh, so it's um, no... Um, uh, no uh, doctor and no uh, other stuff um, is required to handle it anymore and doing it in a safe uh, way in the environment. But what you have seen, we provided some edge capabilities were, uh, connected to the 5G network core directly, providing image uh, or computer vision, recognizing things. So recognizing, for example, also medical equipment or other things which are out of line and directly placing it uh, on a map so that you can find it more easily. You trace it and you retrieve it more easily. Just an idea how information, which is usually not used, uh, can be used as well for further use cases because you start with automated transport. Just thinking about the information uh, involved in the process, what we call information logistics. Um, you could derive many more use cases and out of a sudden is a high value case. It's the same in logistics. And um, also when we discussed it uh, with the colleagues from the hospitals, um, they also told us that it might be quite helpful um, to have something like that in place, trained to their specific needs and directly run on top with the same uh, setup we had beforehand, basically. But as I said before, uh, I talked about connectivity and connected not only about 5G, because that's not always um, what we find and not always what we would advise on. Also, when we uh, go in together and talk to the customers, it's first, as I said, understanding the situation. What are the real needs? What information do they need? How do they need it? What kind of narrative and so on? And then you choose what's right for it. What's right in a functional, way when you set it up, what kind of flexibility you need, for example, as you can see here, um, that was and, and is actually uh, still especially true. What is the anti-device availability? Of course, that's an easy thing for LTE and Wi-Fi. You find many, many, many devices. The 5G, it's a very low end because there are only maybe the mobile devices we know um, which might be available with 5G. Other equipment um, has to be retrofitted. That's also something we are testing, we're working on, but it increases the costs and makes it a little bit trickier uh, to implement a full stack architecture. But that's on the rise, that will come. And I think won't be a problem in the next two to three years anymore in that regard. Until then, um, it's a one by one decision, so to say. And here you see some other of the criteria. This is just a small selection of things we do in the different parts of a solution stack we are working on. And this is just connectivity and just these um, network or connectivity technologies we're talking about, not considering even the Bluetooth and other capabilities uh, you might see, which might be also 
um, sensible from time to time to use. Here, uh, just diving into connectivity a little bit more and handing over to Manfred, we see even a different choice we have to make and that's especially tricky for the different countries. How does the network look like? What frequencies do we use? Indeed, uh, frequencies is a big, big, big one issue locally in, in Europe. So um, Germany um, was this country was the first one country where you have available frequencies. Other countries are just coming. There's uh, the UK, there's Sweden. Um, where now are frequencies available, but um, overall frequencies are mostly restricted and you need a partner like the telco to, to implement um, a, a solution. But often you, you, you do not need this partner or you want this partner because um, you have special one requirements, you have uh, data protection requirements. So if you have a provider, you never know where you got to go. And so there are a lot of um, clinics here um where the requirement is okay the data aren't allowed to to move away from from the area where the clinic is so all the data has to stay on the area on the clinic and if it's go out uh, to, to the cloud we are cloud <laughs> of a cloud and we are totally going to cloud but um, uh, the cloud is, is a thing where some uh, clinics where the public services do not trust so uh, a lot so and so we uh, we have to to realize closed networks small one networks with the right one uh, frequencies but uh, christian let me uh, show you also a little bit about your uh, what you have shown before, so Fujitsu, they have a company uh, uh, called Globe Ranger, that's a US company, starting from uh, the defense perspective, but later on this the company, uh, they, they police, so we have um, set up a um, solution that every police officer get all the stuff with him so and it's also usable in, in a clinic and in the netherlands we set it up a, a clinic where we have an overview of dashboarding and you have seen in the first one um, um first one um, report today that it's also really important to um, show where things are and there are dashboarding is really important and we implement a, a dashboard where you can see all these uh, things moving static it's not so complicated but uh, uh, things to, to 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 see moving from one to the other point is important but at the end uh, I see we should come to to do to the end artificial intelligence is the third thing I would like to raise here yeah uh, um, Fujitsu has some development technology called Digital Anila. It's a technology they can't um, calculate uh, really, really fast optimums. Um, and this, with this technology, uh, we are able to support also in the diagnostics uh, in, in, in the, the clinics. But uh, these are supporting technologies guess really really important to have a dashboarding really important to have um, artificial intelligence to have um, technology technologies by digital anila but at the end and this is the main challenge we have to to solve here in in europe because we have so a lot of different countries we have so, so a lot of different frequencies we have to solve this frequency issue first but we i guess we are really on a, on a good way and if you set up partnerships with different telcos, and in some cases you, you hold it private, then you're able to solve this issue very well uh, here in Europe. I hope this is uh, something uh, you can also, where you learn for, from some of these issues here. And maybe just um, summarizing it up to stay a little bit uh, uh, in the time schedule. Um, this is what we are dealing with in all the different um, domains, as you can see it. 
basically combining um, what's happening on the ground in the physical realm, might it be with the patients, the beds, um, the diagnostic machinery, all the assets on, on the operational technology side, um, figuring out what kind of IOTs we need in terms of sensors, maybe also how to provide certain kind of information directly on hand, if it's even in um, remote operations, might be also on a day-to-day -day business uh, with AR and VR, figuring out how to provide these data streams in both directions, what kind of network, what kind of setup, uh, maybe also hybrid connectivity in that, then actually having the foundation with the right cloud and edge infrastructure uh, combined with the different uh, services, also apps as we learned and business applications run uh, to support the operations to actually provide AI uh, in the different fields for optimization. And that's overall a big digitization journey. We can't go on alone. You always have to do it with partners from the first assessment for the use case specification, identification and basically translation so that you can design the right solution of all of these components, uses for optimization, still taking care that everyone is involved so that the transformation works and also creates the value of productive use you're looking for. And we always recommend, and that's what we also like to do, start with prototype, start with proof of concept, but then having the right technology in place to scale it directly from there, not having to rebuild it, and then find for later on the right operation, right architecture to support it. So from our point of view, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to present it from the more technology side. And we're very eager to share some more pilots and proof of concepts as they go along, and then also in more detail and answer any questions you might have. Uh, thanks, Kristen and Manfred. Uh, there are some questions in the Q&A box uh, to you guys. Uh, please take a look. Uh, so sorry about for some delay in the agenda. So let me now invite uh, another speaker uh, who are from the healthcare sector, uh, Dr. Chelsea uh, Samson. Uh, she's the uh, Chief Business and Medical Affairs Officer in Health Now. Uh, she will deliver about the topic, get the healthcare you need in your way. Uh, thank you. Uh, Chris, can you stop sharing? Uh, thank you. Over to you, Chelsea. Thank you, Terence. Just give me a moment. All right. Okay, thank you for the introduction, Terence, and good afternoon, everyone. It is a great pleasure for me to be with you all today. My segment will talk a bit about telehealth in the Philippines, introduce our platform HealthNow, and how advancements in digital technology, some of which are applied in HealthNow, can revolutionize the way healthcare is delivered, giving us the healthcare we need our way. Now, as we have all been made to experience, the pandemic has changed everything about the way things used to work and how we lived our lives. Um, in the Philippines, patients and doctors have constantly experienced pain points in the healthcare system, uh, especially around reach and continuity of care, specifically poor and inequitable healthcare access, negative health seeking behavior and high out of pocket costs. Now this situation has been present even before the pandemic, but with COVID-19, these have been brought even more sharply into focus. But within the circumstance, there arose an opportunity, particularly for telehealth, driven by rapidly evolving technologies, but primarily by the tremendous leaps in internet connectivity. While growth in Philippine telehealth began in 98, with acts being proposed in Congress from 2012 to 2016, it unfortunately did not pick up due to fragmented lobbying, and pre-pandemic systems focused too highly on face-to-face -face healthcare delivery. The pandemic changed all of that and pushed an accelerated adoption to telehealth. Now Juniper Research projects a global annual growth rate of 17.1% in teleconsultations from 348 million in 2020 
to 765 million in 2025. In the Philippines alone, we saw a 50% increase in telehealth services during COVID-19. There clearly is a need for effective telehealth delivery, for supportive policies and framework, and better acceptance of this technological and societal shift among patients and providers. It is in this vein that we have reimagined healthcare into health now. Health Now is a joint venture between Ayala Health and 917 Ventures, the corporate incubator of one of the country's largest telecom provider, Globe Telecom. Health Now is an integrator platform that envisions to bring health and care to every Filipino in one tap. With its goal of promoting continuity of care as a simple connected journey and breaking the silos in the Philippine healthcare space, Health Now is poised to grow and support the digital transformation of the country's healthcare services amidst the new normal. Our promise is for Health Now to give patients simple and easy access to the care that they need. Health Now extends the front lines of healthcare beyond the brick and mortar. Today, we've helped thousands of lives all over the country to easily consult with licensed healthcare providers, get virtual prescriptions, buy their medicines for home delivery, and later on in the year, access diagnostic booking for in-clinic, in-hospital, and for home service. With the aforementioned services, we carry out our mission by focusing on access, continuity of care, as well as education for both our patients and providers. Now, since our launch in August 2020 and through our various initiatives, we've been able to engage over 1 million registered users and over 150,000 monthly active users who are cared for by over 2,000 doctors and ancillary healthcare providers in our network. We've also reached nationwide service for online medicine ordering and delivery, ensuring a more seamless experience for our patients in their healthcare journey. Majority of our customers are female, digital natives, likely the healthcare managers of their homes. They are either professionals or transitioning to home life as a family. They use Android primarily and pay through one of our cashless methods, Gcash. Interestingly enough, we've observed recent trends which include a shift to a more active role by the population to keep healthy and live a better lifestyle to avoid contracting COVID-19. Additionally, we also see a shift in our user demographic to a younger population, to the Gen Zs taking control of their healthcare needs, bypassing their parents and their guardians because telehealth empowers them to easily take ownership of their health. On the flip side, the majority of our healthcare providers are also female, recently graduated with about one to five years of experience in their 30s to 40s. While we do have a large percentage of primary care physicians whose practice is more adaptable to telehealth, the majority of our pool reaches across 45 different specializations, including ancillary health providers, and across various institutions from hospitals to multi-specialty clinics to pharmacies. With Health Now, we make getting and providing care easy. So allow me to show you briefly how through Tessa's journey. Tessa, a 34-year-old mom from Makati, has been experiencing dizziness for the past two days. She's noticed an increase in appetite and frequency in urination for quite some time now. Worried about her condition, she turns to Health Now for help. Tessa sees a doctor on the spot through Consult Now. After reviewing her symptoms, a general physician diagnoses her with diabetes mellitus type 2 and refers her for a diagnostic workup. Tessa uses Health Now to book her diagnostics to be done safely at home. After receiving her results, she returns to use consult later to schedule her consultation for her diagnostic reading. She uses a promo code to avail her free follow-up from a partner physician. At the appointed time, she's reminded of her upcoming schedule. Tessa is promptly able to see the doctor on video and receives an e-prescription and guidelines for maintenance. 
Tessa then proceeds to buy her prescribed medicine and remote monitoring device through HealthNow's medicine delivery. Here, she is able to attach the e-prescription from her latest consultation. After checkout, she sits back and waits for her order to arrive. A few months later, she's reminded to book her follow-up diagnostic as prescribed by the doctor. She receives a discount for her next booking. Tessa feels empowered to get the help she needs for herself and her loved ones and is rewarded for her improved outcomes. Through continuous care, she's in the best shape of her life and has maintained her health with Health Now. Now, beyond the technology, what drives Health Now and makes it different is its aim to create and foster a dynamic ecosystem to serve both patients and providers. We recognize that indeed, only by breaking the silos, working together as a whole, and leveraging each player's strengths in the industry, can we truly hope to be revolutionary and bring added value to each opportunity. To that effect, and to elaborate further from left to right, HealthNow has been working with various stakeholders in both ends of the supply chain spectrum. From being a part of COVID Shield, the largest private sector effort contributing to COVID-19 primary and booster vaccinations, working with local government units like the Quezon City Health Department um, to support females, uh, female persons deprived of liberty and give them access to quality health care, to collaborating with healthcare partners and designers to give complementary products and services, to engaging uh, 3PL providers to ensure efficient and effective delivery of our medicines, to expanded promotions and holistic development of our partner providers. Still, I cannot overemphasize the importance of advancements in technology. The ecosystem play is only as strong and secure as the technology that scaffolds it. Now, as a developing country, we understand the need for better tech infrastructure and that by doing so, we can elevate and transform the way we are able to do things. According to the latest report by independent mobile analytics company OpenSignal, the Philippines has shown the biggest improvement in download speeds globally, with average fifth generation wireless technology download speeds nearly 10 times faster than the other 4G technology, our country may see that growth sooner rather than later as the availability of 5G ready devices and several 5G network sites have already been established primarily in our national capital region, but also in select provinces. For healthcare, and as wonderfully presented by our previous speakers, adding a high-speed 5G network to existing architectures will help quickly and reliably transport huge medical data files and real-time, high-quality, mobile-based telehealth services and interactions. Other 5G-enabled technologies such as AI, AR, VR, has enormous potential to improve diagnoses, determine best treatment plans for specific patients, and predict post-treatment complications to enable early interventions when necessary. 5G networks will provide a win one millisecond response latency, a boon to current low bandwidth networks where transmission takes a long time or even abort, averting care efficiency. Still, given 5G's limited range and the challenges of its rollout, maintenance and penetration into the rural areas of our country, there is still quite a long way before the Philippines uh, can enjoy the best of wireless, but the horizon is promising. As I've already enumerated a few things previously in this slide, allow me to focus on the key takeaway, takeaways instead. With next generation connectivity, healthcare ecosystems and institutions can look forward to optimizing the full potential of digital technology, evolving from passive to active health, integrating easily into current lifestyles, not only for patients and consumers, but as the first G, focus on organizations and businesses, improving efficiency and reducing overall costs. Moving forward in health now, we look optimistically to a more universal rollout of the next generation technologies so we can build into our product the best in healthcare that our country has to offer 
not only because we can, or that it is the natural next step in the digital evolution, but because the best in healthcare means getting the healthcare you need your way. And with that, I end my presentation. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Chelsea. Uh, really appreciate uh, for you have done uh, for benefit uh, the Philippine. Uh, I think it's very promising uh, to see the very fast development especially during the COVID-19 period. So again, sorry for some delay in the agenda. Uh, we have a very good uh, speaker and information. So now it is our uh, panel. Uh, let me introduce our moderator, CK uh, uh, Rakama. Uh, he's the founder of uh, All Things Connect. He's the uh, founder of uh, IoT uh, Singapore Association and also the CEO of uh, All Things Connected. Uh, he's uh, my friend and very professional on uh, providing uh, digital transformation consulting. So let me uh, pass to you, CK. Please help to introduce the rest of the panel. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Terence. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, warm welcome again to this GSMA virtual fireside chat. We have been talking about connected healthcare in 5G era. And wonderful presentation, Chelsea. Uh, thanks for sharing the insights and setting the ground of what we're going to discuss now. Uh, as Terence introduced myself, that uh, I'm founder of All Things Connected based out of Singapore. All Things Connected is a digital transformation strategy and solutions company based out of Singapore and focus in Southeast Asia. And I'm very pleased to be joined by our experts to discuss how we can accelerate the digital transformation with policies, technology, and ecosystems and partnerships. Part of it has been covered by my previous speakers, uh, including Chelsea. Uh, but there's a lot to unpack still. Uh, before we jump into the discussion, let's meet our panelists. I think Chelsea doesn't need an introduction. So I would request our other two panel uh, panelists to just give a quick, short introduction, David and Dewey. Maybe we'll start with uh, Dewey first. Sure. Hey, I'm Dewey from FPT Software, and I work in the digital transformation department. And we do all sorts of things from AI, cloud, uh, business process re-engineering with uh, all sorts of in, uh, industries, including healthcare. Yep, thanks, thanks, Joel. Hi, CK, thanks for the invitation. So my name is Dave Mohali. I work for Huawei. I lead a business research lab um, based in Europe and in China. And one of the areas where we're very actively focused on is looking at the business transformation impacts of 5G in different vertical markets. And obviously healthcare globally is, is a huge focus, particularly in the last number of years. So looking forward to the discussion today. Thank you both and obviously Chelsea the chief business and medical officers at Health Now. So let's let's get into the conversation. And I have prepared some questions for my own experience. Uh, and for the audience, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to post the questions in the Q&A. We'll have some time for the Q&A later, but go ahead and post it now. If I can take it now in the beginning, uh, during the conversation, we'll be do, doing so also. So my first question, and I was listening to those, some of the presentation in the uh, previous speakers also. Uh, my question first one is to do it. And uh, we have been speaking about COVID uh, uh, for I think long enough now. And uh, everyone has accepted and seen the importance and the gaps of healthcare infrastructure. And many startups and scale-ups also have raised hundreds of millions of dollars in the name of telehealth, remote surgery, AI, or blockchain, no matter what. But based on your experience, Joy, and maybe some of the work which FPT does, uh, what kind of emerging technology which you see actually are being used? There are future, what are the potential? But have you seen what is actually being utilized? Uh, if you can give some examples as use cases. Yeah, uh, so things are getting more mature, right? Especially AI, cloud services, um, and even like uh, blockchain with uh, privacy. So, uh, with FPT, we've been working on projects uh, from um, like platform solutions for a more smarter hospital operation to applying AI to specific use cases, especially in imaging uh, to help doctors. Uh, so um, there's this quote that goes, uh, doctors using AIs will probably replace doctors, but uh, AIs won't replace doctors. So uh, I, I see AI helping a lot with uh, diagnosis uh, and speeding up um, time and resource so the doctors can focus on other important things that machines can do really well. So uh, those are some things that I see uh, uh, as emerging technologies and uh, projects that FPT have been working on. 
Sure. And continuing to what uh, you mentioned, Doyen, if I go to now, David, uh, we have heard of some of the use cases and emerging technologies, but we also know that there is no one company can do everything. When you talk about IoT or digital transformation, some company provide devices, some company provide connectivity, some company provide platform and so forth. So we need to enable the ecosystems and partnership among the various technology and domain experts to be able to solve those use cases. So as a connective expert, uh, how Huawei is driving the connected healthcare in the 5G era. So could you share some of those ecosystems and partnership approach from Huawei and even of your personal uh, viewpoint here? Yeah, sure, CK. Yeah, I mean, as, as, as Dewey mentioned, I think, you know, as, as has been mentioned in previous speakers, right, globally, healthcare is moving Okay, it's starting with kind of digitizing hospitals and we saw some fantastic examples from the hospital authority at the first speaker, you know, the fantastic advances they've made, but globally, it's also moving out and into the community and we saw a number of examples of that, right, so that the benefits from global studies is that these have very positive impacts for the quality of care and even the, 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 the costs associated with the care, right, so as it moves out into regional hospitals and community clinics and even into the home, the role of a of a stable kind of low latency, highly highly reliable communications there becomes very important, you know. And we believe kind of central to the to the longer term digitization of healthcare, you know. So, like if you look in Japan or in Singapore, there's a lot of initiatives that are focused on moving out and digitizing the community and digitizing the population. And 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 Chelsea mentioned some great examples from Health Now earlier, so. For example, in in Thailand, uh, you know Huawei has worked very closely, and as you mentioned, ecosystems are pretty crucial. And working with the health authority, working with hospitals, public, private, so there's a lot of different stakeholders involved in in, in the healthcare setting. As we know, you know, we saw a great picture from Chelsea there previously showing kind of pharmacies delivery options. So. One example that, that Huawei was involved in, um, and it, it's publicly available out there in Thailand with the Siraj Hospital, and there is a great example of kind of what 5G can do in a very large public hospital. Siraj is, is the largest public hospital in Thailand, and there is a very, it's a, it's a kind of a melting pot of a lot of the applications we heard earlier. So telemedicine became very important during the pandemic not just for connecting to consumers and the population, but also for connecting clinicians in different settings, you know, um, where people needed the, the, the expertise that may be based in Bangkok and not in the, in the regional centers. They were ab easily able to do it over 5G connections uh, powered by telehealth. Smart Ambulance we've seen, and, and we've seen some a lot of great case studies in, in Thailand where kind of in-vehicle diagnostics, AR glasses is passed in real time to physicians. So kind of streamline the care of the of the of the people and then ai absolutely i couldn't agree more ai looking forward and even today the benefits of of kind of streamlining ai processing is is a is a, an important application where 5g can power you know i to do his point we've seen examples in thailand in some of the healthcare settings where the where the five, the role of 5g is is really to enable the transfer of lots of imaging information in real time onto cloud platforms that can then have algorithms run on them. And the benefit is not to replace anybody, but it's to streamline and make the healthcare consultants more efficient, you know? So, right. so, so there's, a lot, there's a lot of real world examples of, of benefiting what people are doing today. And then in the future, you will have new and more important applications coming up, I think. I guess one one takeaway I would recommend is that what we've learned from the early projects that have kind of had sponsorship at a national level is that really 5G as an important technology should be recommended as a part of the technology stack for healthcare, right? In regional, in hospital settings, so that you're not trying to retrofit, you're trying to build it in and plan it in as a part of what you're doing in your digital transformation of health. You know? Right, interesting. So yeah, so... Uh... There's a technology stack when we talk about any use case in bid healthcare or, or any other industry for the matter. So like I mentioned earlier, there's some company provide and devices, maybe in the healthcare space, uh, who are making smart devices like smart stethoscope or machines who are capturing the data. Then there are companies who are providing connectivity layer like Huawei or many more to capture the data, to push to the gateways and the cloud. Then there are companies who are 
providing AI and ML platform to analyze it. And then there are companies who are building application, which the end customers or the doctor use. So that's a technical ecosystem, but also there are other players, particularly in healthcare, like uh, uh, regulatory bodies, government agencies. So my question to Chelsea, uh, Chelsea is uh, that you spoke earlier about get the healthcare you need your way. And uh, uh, it's, it's very powerful, but at the same time, it does require a lot of changes in the policies and the framework, such as providing customized and personalized services and systems and process that need to work together. And based on my experience and, and knowledge, healthcare policies and framework are understandably very tight, uh, tightly uh, designed and uh, rigid uh, to keep pace with the technology transformation. So based on your experience, which you have been working with health now and many other players in this ecosystems, what are the key bottlenecks uh, we see in the current policies? And what is your thoughts and what is your view on how we can make them better or transform them to enable truly connected healthcare, but rather than keep struggling with the policies one side and the technology one side? Thanks for that question, CK, and that's actually quite an interesting point. Now, to give a use case situated within my country's legal system and policy framework, I mentioned earlier in my presentation that while there are acts being deliberated in government, there still actually isn't a law that regulates telehealth in our country, and I think that's the largest bottleneck that we're experiencing. And this situation may be the case as well in other developing countries. Other bottlenecks we've experienced include the following. Number one, that you know, different aspects of telehealth fall under different regulatory bodies because of the lack of one specific governing law. And so more effort needs to be made to comply with every single regulation. This in turn slows down our processes and sometimes delays the launch of certain things um, and offerings. Another bottleneck is that current policies, not necessarily related to telehealth, but impacts the services beyond it. For example, the rise of gig economy or the subsequent, um, uh, sorry, um, you know, but the impacts beyond it have not, not really changed to adapt to the pandemic or the subsequent shifts in healthcare print. Practices. So, for example, like I mentioned earlier, the rise of gig economy among many healthcare practitioners is hindered because regulation has not adapted to the change. Regulation continues to provide strict criteria for these professionals that they, for example, need to be um, legally affiliated with a single institution which prevents more entrepreneurial setups. Another one, um, not tied to regulation per se, but is a framework of practice in the country, is that there is no universality, no mandate uh, to providers to give patients portability of their medical data. So what happens instead is that every single time a patient consults, they would need to repeat their history and diagnostics whenever they meet a new provider or go to a new institution. On the upside, our Department of Health, uh, through the National eHealth Program, has begun, has begun accreditations of telehealth providers. So HealthNow, as, as one of only six um, accredited telehealth providers, is made to comply with uh, set standards and platform, data security, and quality of patient care. Um, and we are also given an avenue to give our feedback and recommendations to the working group in better crafting the law. What needs to be emphasized, though, is that these policies must keep up with the times and trends of the healthcare landscape. They also need to be flexible, collaborative, and fast enough to support the growth of the industry to enable a truly connected healthcare. Right. And uh, let, let's put a bit of scenario play here. And uh, I'll... I'll pose this question to all three of you. Uh, and I've seen this use case been talked about many times. So telehealth has a wide spectrum of use cases. So let's pick up on use cases of remote surgery, which we talk about a lot. So presume uh, that there's a doctor in UK uh, who have to work under the UK regulations and the infrastructure, be it a connectivity side of it. Uh, but there is a patient in Indonesia and uh, uh, he have to be served under Indonesian regulations and the infrastructure is Indonesian. So in this scenario, if you talk about three elements, with one is the technology side of it, the, the connectivity layer, infrastructure layer in UK, when the doctor is giving command to operate a patient in Indonesia, that's part of the technical infrastructure, keep in mind, we have to, we have to keep in mind. Then the ecosystem, so who need to get involved from technology as well as I'm sure the regulation point of view, and then what are the policies? So Tachuj, 
everything goes well, then nothing wrong. But if something goes wrong in this situation, how do we have to deal with? Are we ready for that or not? So, uh, like I said, I would like to hear all three of you. So, based on your interest, uh, maybe Duo could help me some of the technical aspects of it. That uh, how do you think this uh, idea of remote surgery could really be uh, delivered beyond pilot? Uh, from David point of view, maybe it will be good to know how do we look at the end-to-end -end solution ecosystem beyond connectivity layer. Yes, we need to have a strong pipe to make sure the command given is received within milliseconds uh, to the to the robotic arm. But beyond that, and then lastly, again, one more time, Chelsea, from your side of it, that the multiple agencies, the policies have to come together when you're talking about global kind of use cases within Philippines, within Indo in Singapore, within Indonesia, maybe. Uh, I won't say it's easy, but it's still manageable. But now we're talking about global telehealth solution. So let's let's hear maybe in the particular order. Let's hear from Dua and then David and then Chelsea. Okay. So I mean, it's really possible, but there are a couple of hurdles right now that uh, will make this scenario um, more reality. And I guess that starts with um, having the infrastructure first. Uh, so to perform these telesurgery. Uh, you need super like low latency networks. Uh, and the second thing is the availability of having these robots, uh, which are fairly specialized and expensive, not everywhere has it. Um, so on the technology aspect with uh, those things um, to level the playing field, especially in uh, developing countries, I think that would be the first hurdle uh, from a technology standpoint. Um, and then there's some other things too, such as uh, uh, security. Um, so you really have to make sure that uh, the security is sound. Um, and, uh, but I can see a ton of other like regulations and stuff. I'm sure Chelsea will uh, talk more about, but uh, those are the things that first come up in my head when a system like this is implemented. Yeah. Right. And uh, how do you think about this scenario, uh, David, to make it really yeah. happen? I mean, I think we've all seen, you know, demos and examples of this type of application. I, but I think this hitting the real world is maybe, you know, it's not a near term or ver maybe very realistic thing. So I think technically you can, and there's lots of examples of providing low, late and stable networks globally. You know, you have some very big SD-WAN providers that can give you whatever characteristics you need at a particular price. Um, so, so technically these things are doable, I think. A number of the challenges, though, are going to be down to the kind of regulatory side and the information sharing and the security and and the risks associated from a healthcare perspective. You know, um, I know we've spoken to to robotic um, uh, companies in the past, and and realistically, these type of very remote scenarios may not happen in the mainstream. You know, even if technically it, 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 we can we can show that it's possible. Um, I think one thing that what's what's quite important, and I think it got mentioned a little bit earlier, is the whole concept of, of data sharing and security. And I think, like if you look in the EU, the EU has a number of initiatives around things like uh, the international data spaces, where they're looking to define vocabularies within industries like healthcare or manufacturing, so that information can be shared in a in a secure and kind of um trusted manner right so they're creating these soft infrastructure layers is what they call them and i think a lot of these things have to come on really so that the parties are happy that there's the right level of interaction the right level of security the right level of privacy and trust to enable them you know so you know i think it's i think it's more likely ck that these these type of applications will target and optimize things that are happening today in the healthcare setting, in remote clinics and within, you mentioned earlier, you know, the ecosystem of, let's say, diagnostic machine companies, right, that have, you know, ultrasound devices and, and um, you know, EKG devices and stuff like this. So, so these types of things deliver quite significant benefits for low cost in the very near term, you know, so I think these are likely to be the more um, impactful things from a healthcare setting rather than these kind of whoa use cases that you, you know, we've seen at trade shows and stuff. Right. So let's presume, uh, Chelsea, that we have all this wonderful technology at our disposal. Uh, we load latency, uh, high performance systems, but still um, the situation I mentioned that if everything goes well, then it's wonderful, but if something doesn't work. So have you seen such regulations 
if not been implemented, been talked about at least that if we reach to that level of a remote surgery kind of a use cases, which we think we should do work towards it, but what are the regulations are in place right now? Yeah, now generally speaking, each country has specific laws and regulations on who can practice medicine and up to what level of practice that physician can do and upon whom. Now, given your example that doctor licensed in the UK will need to, prior to practicing in Indonesia, make known his or her intention to practice, provide the scope and duration, be supervised perhaps by a local counterpart and attain certain documents within the mandates given, um, you know, for, for example, by Indonesia's Ministry of Health or Medical Council. Now, some countries have reciprocity agreements, which allow for a certain level of practice with other nations, and this could be a base to work with. Nonetheless, it should be clearly stated, um, aside from the responsibilities of the professional, the liabilities and obligations of the foreign doctor or the local counterpart responsible. You know, I'd like to say that policies in place for these circumstances are clear, but with medical practice made even more convenient through digital solutions where, you know, like in the example given patient and provider are not geographically in the same location, it does get quite a bit tricky. So policymakers will need to look into these situations, review and update them and perhaps come up with an international guideline because, you know, they're slowly becoming a practice norm around the world. Right. I think those are the things which uh, which I hear the most of the time challenges are that technology may be still moving fast enough, but maybe regulations are not. And uh, yeah. again, depending on the situations and the scenarios, some may be possible today, but some may still have to work a long way to go. I'm just looking at the Q&A tab also. There's a question from Mike Short. Uh, he's, he mentioned that most of the speakers, uh, I think, are talking about the horizontal solution, but there are vertical specific disease kind of solution uh, use cases like dementia or diabetic and obesity which are not all hospital based so while you would like to give some comments just maybe my quick answer so i'm also looking onto this vertical specific use cases and the solutions in fact mr one of the startup i'm advising it working on the dementia problem and as you know uh, dementia is uh, kind of a very uh, critical challenges as typically people age and uh, it cost billions of dollars to the economy. And, uh, I was reading uh, some numbers, I think in Singapore, it cost about four to $5 billion to Singapore and, and tying it with the aging population, it is putting more stress to the, to the, the economy as well as the people working professionals. But what kind of dementia solution should look like? Will it be a variable? Will it be simple? Uh, uh, application. So this is kind of thing which I'm working with the startup to come up with the solution that uh, which may individually become personalized dementia problem, sorry, dementia solution because each dementia patient will be of different uh, seriousness or different needs. At the same time, how this solution can integrate with the HMS uh, in the healthcare systems and maybe even the emergency and rescue departments out of the smart cities initiatives. So yeah, so I'd love to discuss specific use cases, but any, any quick thoughts on uh, Mike's question on specific use cases? Yeah, one, yeah. One. Oh, go ahead. And, and please, yeah. Just, 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 yeah, maybe a quick comment. Um, yeah, so I think on, I think the, the question is super relevant. I mean, what, what we've seen is that the, there's, a, there's an absolute myriad of partners that you can partner on, on, on different vertical specifics. Like if you look at dementia, for example, dementia, sorry, dementia or diabetes. Diabetes is one we've looked quite closely because globally it's a, it's a huge problem as, as we all know. And there are a lot of, I guess, relatively mature, let's say IOT type, you know, products that are patches connected to mobile phones and stuff like this. So there is a lot of synergies between connecting these things wirelessly into an ecosystem you know and we've looked at that in other markets for sure um so the, there's i think there's huge opportunities like for example in in ireland where i'm based we work with a national health provider and they have a number of national hubs and a, a key part of that is identifying companies that have diagnostic devices and relatively mature products right so that they can integrate them in they've got a they've usually got a kind of commercial base already so the technology is proven it's certified and then they roll it out into their clinics very quickly, you know. So absolutely, I think it's 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 very complementary. Another one we looked at very briefly is the whole area of um, 
you know, kind of smart inhaler concepts. So taking something that's very, it's very well established. You're, you're really, you, you, this is in your domain, CK, with, you know, you're really converting it into an IoT device and the benefits are hugely significant for the consumer, for the practitioners, for everybody, you know? So absolutely, I think it's very relevant. Correct. I would like to add a quick one, Roy or Chelsea on this. Oh uh, yeah, I mean, um... In terms of vertical uh, applications of this uh, AI, for sure. I mean, there's there's a lot of technology that, uh, since these AI models are being more uh, mature, uh, they can help doctors diagnose a lot of these diseases uh, with greater accuracy, um, and also help them uh, like instead of some some people making mistakes, which I mean we're all human, uh, they can definitely increase the accuracy of the diagnosis. So, and that can be applied to all sorts of diseases um, that uh, were mentioned in the question, yeah. Yep, yep. So I, I see as a, as I get involved with a lot of startups ecosystem, so I see a lot of vertical use cases, be it dementia, diabetic, even some of the use cases, which helps the females to plan their pregnancy because a lot of uh, the couples are not able to have kids. So uh, they, ha they has, there are solutions with like as simple as using mobile camera to do the yes. vision inspection of the sample and quickly figure it out uh, whether the, the, there's a time for pregnancy or not. But at the same time, I think this vertical use case have to be integrated at the horizontal level also so that it could be largely utilized for not only for the, uh, the reactive part of it, but more prediction and prescription side of it at the larger level. Uh, I'm just looking at the time, maybe one quick uh, summary questions, uh, which I'm personally always wondering about this data security and data privacy. And as you know, both are different topics. Security is more of a technical topic, how we make sure that data is secured end to end, uh, but more from the privacy point of view that how do we make sure the, uh, the health data, which is I think more expensive than the, even the financial data, according to some numbers is secure. So we want to have a lot of customized, personalized, uh, support and health. At the same time, we're always conscious that how our data is being used. So any quick, like uh, short uh, answer from all three of you to begin with Chelsea and then David and uh, Duane on this topic of data privacy and security. So data and privacy and security really should be made paramount in any digital technology solution, especially in healthcare. Um, it's only with this promise really that patients will be able to feel safe and secure in the knowledge that their sensitive data is kept private um, in digital transactions. Sure, and David, how do you look at the security? Yeah, the security yeah I, I, I mean, I totally agree. I mean, security absolutely needs to be paramount and baked in by design in, into these types of application as well as other applications. But I think on, on the data privacy side, I think for healthcare in particular, I mentioned uh, some examples from Europe earlier, things like the international data spaces. And I think governments and policymakers need to be involved in, in defining, you know, ways in which information can be shared. So even when you travel, that you can carry your data with you. It can be consumed by, you know, a provider when you're on vacation in a way that's understandable, you know, and these things can't be done by individual companies. So I think, I know in Europe, they're regulating for it to allow information to be passed within different European states more seamlessly. It's still early and there's lots of complications as always, but um, this is one thing that's happening on the regulatory side. And then on the practical side, they're launching things like uh, Gaia X and IDSA to put technology blueprints to help information get shared at the kind of, you know, at the technology level as well. So it's regulation and technology trying to come together to allow this kind of common vocabulary within within a space and in in europe they're developing things like um you know connector technologies which allow a publisher and a consumer of information pass only the data that they're happy to pass with policies attached to it so even at the technology layer they're starting to bake in the concepts of control and very sensitive information you know right yeah and uh, a comment from do it, maybe from the technology side of it, how could we use technology to maybe secure it? Like we talk about blockchain and other such uh, technology. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. So uh, one thing that's actually emerging is the use of using blockchain to make uh, two things happen in healthcare. The first is uh, transfer of medical records from one uh, agency to another or organization to a customer. 
Uh, so they'll use blockchain technology so that it ensures that the only person that can get it is that person or that uh, organization. Another thing that they're using blockchain technology in to help secure uh, is transactions. Um, so like insurance payments uh, and uh, payments to uh, medical service providers uh, instead of uh, fraudulent. Uh, so there's like fraudulent scams that can happen. So these blockchain technologies will help ensure that they are the authentic uh, service provider or um, organization that's requesting uh, these payments and stuff. Yeah, so those are two ways that I think blockchain is being applied to healthcare industries. Uh, and more and more as the mature uh, technology matures, I think it will be adopted more widely. Sure, I think this topic is uh, complex to be covered in 35 minutes. Uh, I'm just looking at the audience if they have any questions. Uh, so while they have any questions, so let's have a quick round of summary, uh, maybe any takeaway, which all of you would like to give it to the audience, uh, whether some sort of partnership or some invitation to connect or some projects you want to open for them to partner with you. So let's quick 30 seconds for each of you uh, before we wrap up for the session for today. So we'll begin with Chelsea, David, and then Louis. Yeah, no, um, really, it's been an absolute pleasure for me to be here with everyone today. Um, uh, I'd like to give my thanks to Terrence and the rest of the GSMA team, uh, to CK and to my fellow co-panelists, Dewey and David. Um, really, I've, I've learned a lot uh, from this session. Uh, earlier on, you know, looking at uh, seeing uh, Dr. Chung and uh, Mr. Liu present earlier, you can really see the impact of not just, you know, an app being able to integrate into the community, but also, of course, the bigger systems, right? And that has to be integrated for it to truly make an impact and a difference. So, you know, for, for me in Health Now, uh, we definitely would like to be able to, to connect to everyone. If you'd like to know more, um, please feel free to visit www.healthnow.ph or email us at partners at healthnow.ph. And that's it for me. Have a, have a good and safe afternoon. Thanks, Chelsea and uh, David. From you? Yeah, I, I'd like to echo the thanks to the GSMA and to the fellow panelists and the, and, and the speakers today. I think it was excellent information sharing. And as, as the team here around ecosystems, definitely Huawei is very keen to work with partners in the different markets around Asia. So happy to connect if, if people have solutions and ideas within different markets, connect to us at Huawei and we'd be happy to have that discussion. Thank you, thanks David. And uh, uh, Dwayne, let's close with you. Yeah, so great, like uh, Chelsea just said, I learned a lot from all the speakers today and all the great initiatives, especially I didn't even realize the Hong Kong initiative was one of the biggest worldwide, but they have tons for being an in-house project. That's really amazing work. Um, yeah, I mean, healthcare is definitely a complex beast, uh, very complex systems, a lot of moving parts. I think uh, a lot of things are, I mean, technology seems to be ahead of the time and regulations kind of catch up. But as we see regulations catching up, I think uh, more things will be enabled. Uh, we'll see more uh, user experience uh, being developed, uh, healthcare being pushed to patients more with the self-service model. Uh, yeah, and uh, FPT is happy to be a part of this with helping people on their digital transformation journey. So uh, yeah, feel free to reach out at uh, fptsoftware.com. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to meet everyone today and uh, answer these great questions. Thanks, thanks, do it. And uh, from my side, uh, as the name says, all things connected. Uh, so we like to drive the projects and the solutions in a very partnership approach, work with both sides of the ecosystem, the solution seekers, as you call the solution providers. So if any of you are looking into health tech or maybe in other industries, I uh, would love to connect with you. And uh, this is where I'm working closely with GSMA also and uh, other team members, hopefully as we, as we go forward to drive the realization of technology so that as we speak forward in the next more coming sessions and the years to come, we uh, we see the realization of technologies and, and the benefit of those technologies to solve the real world problems. So thank you again, uh, Terence, for hosting this session. I, I hope everybody has enjoyed it. Uh, the team has also shared quite, quite interesting insights, some reports, some white papers, some connections. I've shared my LinkedIn, so please feel free to, to connect with me offline. And uh, with that, over to you, Terence. Uh... Thanks again for uh, every one of you, uh, especially to my uh, speaker. Uh, I think 
a great uh, section again uh, a lot of interactive question uh, to our speaker uh, i think <clears throat> i think we are not stopping here uh, like what i'm said before uh, we are just start uh, the journey especially on 5g i mean the technology is still evolving uh, so that's why uh, as a global industry association we have to do more and more in order to support uh, you guys to learning uh, adopt the technology. So just want to recap a little bit about uh, our next, uh, we will host an event at Bangkok physically. So uh, welcome to join us if you are in Bangkok or you are traveling to Bangkok. Uh, and also most importantly, we have a uh, regional conference uh, organized by GSMA at Singapore on 2nd to 3rd of August. So we will have a digital healthcare section. So now we are lining up very good speaker uh, from the healthcare sector and the ICT sector. So of course we are very welcome if you are uh, the pioneer on working on this area, just connect me. Uh, I will discuss with you uh, to see whether you can speaking, but at least you will be uh, able to let work in this event. Uh, so keep in touch, uh, see you in our next activity. Uh, bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.